Hello, I hope this finds you well. It is my great pleasure to bring the interview I did with Mr. Sam Sadigursky. Sam is a wonderful multifaceted musician and composer. He has a broad body of work um, that includes his duo project with the accordionist and composer himself, Nathan Cosey, entitled The Solomon Diaries. He's got a newish book of clarinet duets out that are really, really beautiful uh, set of music. And he was gracious enough to play a few of them with me today. Gosh, what else? He's a part of the, uh, the Philip Glass Ensemble, which is really, really amazing. And Darcy Argue's Secret Society, really, truly interesting big band composer in New York. It was a real treat to pick his brain. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed speaking to Sam. If you liked this interview, please don't forget to subscribe. And hey, if you want extra points, um, tell a friend. And as always, please feel free to reach out, say hello. It would be wonderful to hear from you. And without further ado, here is Sam. Bye. <laughs> Can you speak to where this impetus to create comes from? <laughs> well, partly. You didn't want to see the questions ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always just kind of learned by doing. I think that was, I think that's just, I think the real impetus comes from just like, I want to get better at doing this and um, and for me you know like recording re albums has kind of been like the way to like develop music and really kind of like see it to the finish but um, yeah a lot of this goes back to my kind of main teacher growing up it was a guy named Vince Trombetta oh that's right and yeah. I grew up in Los Angeles and he just like happened to live kind of like in the next town over the next suburb over um and uh i was like just so incredibly fortunate to find him and um yeah he's most noted uh for being like michael brecker's teacher but has like an incredible playing resume of his own and he um, was president of the union or something he was right? tr yeah president of the la union and treasurer of the national union um he that that came kind of later in his career um but that was kind of Vince's way of teaching, um, at least with me, was just to like really throw me into the fire. There was not like a met. There was there was like methods and exercises for some things, but I just like I have this really distinct memory of just like you know I'm like learning kind of tunes and like learning just like basic things with like harmony and counterpoint, and it's just like um, this week I want you to write a saxophone quartet of my romance. Okay. And there was no prep for this as to like. This is how you lay it out. This might have. This might ha be like how you want to like first think about it. It was just kind of do it, and I think that has kind of like set up kind of the way that I that I've grown since. And that was actually kind of also the way I learned to improvise. Like we, there was not like this heavy like chord scale and information coming at me. Like I learned to improvise. He told me like, okay, this week write a solo over Blue Skies. And I mean, this was like back when like my knowledge was like, I, c I can read the chord changes and play like root position here. And I was a kid, so I had the time and I'm just gonna like sit at the piano and 
you know, I could play, I'm, I'm doing this, but I could actually play piano because that was my first instrument. Um, but, and just like, I didn't really have like a vocabulary yet. How but old were you like, when you started studying with him? Uh, 12 or 13? Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, th maybe 14. Um, so yeah, I just like, I was the beginning of like having a jazz vocabulary, but you know, just like really like, kind of just got this r sense of just like how things sounded over chords and found, you know, sounds that I like. And it was like real, like huge slowing down of the process. And I'd spent the whole week writing my, you know, chorus out. That's awesome. Are there other models that you have thought about? Like this is somebody I really admire their work or their career that you look to? Um. I think that's always changing. But I think another thing for me is like, I just somehow decided early on, I'm not gonna like curate my output that carefully. I kind of, I remember like having this realization, you know, with my first like few records that like there were tracks that like, not long after it coming out, I'd kind of like cringe, you know, that like, did I really put that out? Yeah. And then, you know, I'd meet somebody who like was a, re a really like, treasured respected colleague and that would be like the track that they really liked so mm -hmm. i just decided like it's not for me to think about and you know and also yeah i remember one time like you know in the beginnings of like my composition in college um i studied with armin danelian like i studied harmony with him as a pianist and composer and you know i remember like bringing something, showing him something that I'd been working on and, you know, being like very insecure about it and him just saying like, you know, if you've spent this much time with it before here, there's something there. And that, that really, that really stayed with me. Oh, interesting. Um, you uh, did you have a good high school band program? What, what was that like? Yeah, that was a huge part of me kind of like, you know, being on this path. I mean, also my parents are both musicians, so, you know, I was exposed to a lot early on. Um, but yeah, it's funny because he's retiring um, this year, but my middle school band teacher was um, a guy named Matt McKagan, who if you're a Guns N' Roses fan, was the brother of Duff McKagan, the <laughs> bass player. So that was, that was pretty cool. That is cool. Um, yeah. But it was actually his first year teaching um, was my first year of middle, middle school, and um, he was somebody who came from the jazz world as a trombonist, and um, was just an incredibly inspired teacher. Um, and yeah, that was like really my first exposure to jazz was was playing in middle school, and um, and yeah, I still yes. remember like, you know, after at the end of like our jazz band things which happened before school um he would put on albums and blast them on his stereo system and like he started encouraging us to bring the albums that we went and picked up and, um, yeah, yeah i remember that being like a really really you know huge thing for me and then high school must have been i know you um i knew you're part of the all-american grammy band you must have had a good high school <laughs> you must have had a great high school program too and we did Yes, there was another really fantastic teacher in high school. And there was also like, yeah, this, uh, this legacy of, of kids who were older than me. I remember, mm. you know, the kid being in middle school and hearing the high school kids and, you know, like just being so blind, blown away yeah. by the level they were playing at. And um, yeah, it's incredible just like how these things in a school, like just like perpetuate themselves. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. The, the, it just becomes like this cultural thing. And um, yeah, this is it program still going is really strong? good. It, yeah, very strong. Um, and uh, yeah, the other thing is like there were just there was a lot of opportunity in LA. There were a lot of you know there was um, kind of a lot of like these scholarships and mentorship programs, and um, I was able to just do a lot of really phenomenal things. Uh, the Monterey Jazz Festival had like a young musicians. Uh, like a big band that would go to Japan every year and I mean I did that twice oh, cool. um, and I think I played at the Monterey Jazz Festival with like Joshua Redman one year and Roy Hargrove and Maria Schneider who you know I've like kept up with you know, 
sense. sense. Um, did you play with Brad Meldow when you were in high school? I did. What, what, um, how did that come to be? Um, Brad moved to LA. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think this was 96 or so. So you were a um, senior. Yeah, and um, somebody introduced me to him and I think he just like didn't really know a lot of people there and his career was kind of like at a quiet point. He was kind of like rebuilding some things. Okay. And um, we just kind of became friends and I think he was just sort of like, uh, I don't know, it's, he was probably like 25 or 26. Uh, I was 17 or 18 and somehow like we became buddies, you know, hearing music and hanging out. And, so you not, uh, you hung out to, with him? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, I, I just like had that like air, in, I mean, I think now it's funny, like 30 years later, I think I'd be like a little bit, like kind of not know what to say yeah. to, to somebody, you know, like him, he's such a hero. But, you know, back then I was just like this arrogant little kid. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I just. And what context did you play? D we like played duo? duo at a place called the the Club Brasserie, um, and uh, yeah, I mean I have no memory. I mean it's funny uh, other people, other people like they're I've, I'm friend I'm friends with somebody who was actually at that gig, and I think he remembers more about it than than I do. Was it one gig or was it? it was yeah, it was just the one gig, just and then gig. years later I did something at Zanko Hall. Um, with him, with oh, wow. the, he wrote this piece. Uh, he was commissioned to do a piece that had um, a lot of woodwind players. I mean, like five or six, and it was like a crazy cast of yeah, Chris Cheek and Josh Redman oh, wow. and Greg Tardy and yeah, like, wow. cool. Yeah. So I think you went to William Patterson, I right? Go to William Patterson. What, yeah. What was it? What was that like? Who did you study with there? Um, I kind of moved around a lot in terms of uh, saxophone teachers. Um, I studied with Steve Wilson the first year. Then he kind of left because uh, he was touring with Chick Corea. Um, and then kind of like bounced around. Um, did a year with Dave Dempsey, who was like kind of the director of the program, but also studied with Joe Allard. So I kind of got the beginnings of that knowledge that after I was done with school, I really sought that out with um, some other people in New York, and that was incredibly helpful for me. Did you always, um, when did you start doubling? Like, was that in high school? Was that? It was actually month? before that. Um, uh, I stud even before I started studying with Vince, um, I was already playing flute, um, I think. Yeah, I think my first teacher, who was also named Vince, um, I kind of like played flute and kind of pushed me to go get one. Oh, um, and um, so that started really early. And I think I was like kind of bored playing in like the concert band. And so I think I moved from playing saxophone to flute and that to like, you know, get a little more challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, and then I started playing clarinet not long after that. I mean, probably like ninth grade or oh, something. No and um, that was just all that was instilled for me. It was instilled just part to me of the mix. really young. Like, you want to do this, yeah. um, you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to double. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, I think I also like doing it. I mean, I had good teachers. Vince Trombetta is an amazing doubler. Is he? Um, and so that was just like a part of my lesson. I mean, I feel like that was part of my weekly lesson or that there was a lot of just like, I still have like my Clause A books and, um, that, that I used with him. And uh, you know, you could see the date and then you could see like another date that said flute or clarinet or I just like remember being in lessons and playing with one, you know, and like midway through it'd stop and like, now let's pick up the clarinet and, and continue it. And oftentimes like also transpose because that was a really big thing that I'm like extraordinarily grateful for. I feel like that's something that's like really been a valuable skill. And then doubling like was something that um, continued to be something that I did and kept me working um, in New York. When you were in college, were you kind of like doing flute clarinet saxophone or were you mainly focused on one of the um, no, I was kind of doing doing all of it. 
Oh. Um, I ended up being like a flute minor, so I had a flute teacher, and then also a really, really fantastic clarinet teacher Who's that? as well. Uh, Marianne Gipfelt, oh, wow. who's now, I think, at Brooklyn College. Oh, cool. Uh, you had this great teacher. You're from L.A. What was the drive to come to New York in the first place and not just stay in L.A.? Um, just very early on, I mean, I remember, you know, probably as a 14 or 15 year old, I just um, saw my future in New York, which is funny because I knew I'd never been here. I think the first time I came, I don't know, I was probably 16 or something. Um, but uh, yeah, just like all my heroes, the people I really loved listening to lived here. And I think that was that was it. And I just knew it was like a bigger scene that felt like there was a lot more opportunity and it was just uh, it was different what did you imagine you know what, what are you like 18 when you moved here to William Patterson um, 19? Yeah, 18. all right so what did you imagine you're like you're gonna do in New York you know like did you I mean did you even I think can having, you remember I think having musician parents I think I was like had a pretty realistic view of like what it actually meant and the dues and I didn't think that like you know there was going to be some like amazing explosion of you know career wise I think like the people so many of the people I listened to really like a lot of things like happened for them maybe later in their career and um yeah I, I didn't really see that like stardom I mean I like I taught I taught lessons like from the time I was like 14 years old um, in LA um, you know charging like $15 a, a lesson or something and driving and and I think driving to the kids houses um, when you're 14 nonetheless yeah well that was no that was when I was once I was 16 um, but um, yeah, God help the big, the parents who were sending their kid to a fifteen and sixteen year old to um to teach them lessons. Um, but uh, yeah, and I, even once I was here in college, I mean, I really like um, that was important to me to just like set myself up to be able to support myself. And um, yeah, and that's that's probably our generation. Like you moved to New York, that was like the first place we saw some like steady income. Craigslist. Just yeah. Started, yeah, Craigslist had just started, and I, I was actually really. I think a lot of people would be kind of like anon anonymous anonymously post um, on Craigslist to to teach, looking for students. Yeah, and I remember at some point, like I set up a website like BrooklynWindStudio.com, and um, you know, really like kind of made an operation out of it, and. Um, yeah, I mean, that's like really more than anything how I supported myself. I would say the first 10 years I was in town and you yeah. know, then, I, then I started to get, I started to get more playing work during that time. Just a young person moving to New York today, any tips, advice um, you might? I don't know, it's, I mean, I kind of know what I did um, and I don't know that that's right for other people. Um, I always just like really love to play, which everybody does, that's kind of stupid. But uh, anyway, I, I love to play. I knew I didn't want to go into like academia. Um, I never got a master's degree. Um, and um, I just kind of like saw myself as like a blue collar musician, like saying yes to, to stuff and um, not really having like a trajectory that I saw myself on. Um, it's funny now, 25 years after, now I feel like I'm a little bit maybe more conscious of like certain decisions of like, you know, like what I say yes to and is this really like the direction I want to go to. but. For me, it was just like saying yes to everything. Yeah. Um, and my, you know, I ended up going in all these like really sideways paths that I'm like so so happy. Yeah. Um, happened. I mean, like there was just randomly I ended up playing like 
Colombian music really heavily with a number of bands I for that band, you know yeah. five or six years, and I mean I learned so much doing that, and then you know I sort of like fell into this scene playing Jewish music like in synagogues, and that was not something like that I calculated. It just sort of like um, came from saying yes to something that was sort of like adjacent to that, and that's like become one of my bread and butter things and actually like has really shaped creatively like a lot of the stuff I'm doing as well. Your first albums were on, it must have been a really fledgling um, record label at the time, right? New, New Amsterdam, Amsterdam Records, yeah. Um, I was the first. Were you the first? Yeah, I think so. Or it might have been like, it was either me or Jody Redditch, cellist. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that was just starting out, and um, I didn't um, know what I was doing. I mean, that was like a time, it was like this 2006 or something, I think that that first Words Project album came out. Um, and yeah, people, it was just before like self-releasing became um, more common, I think. Um, and it really felt important for me for it to be on a label because um, I think I was just yeah. not interested in learning all the other, like the things that actually happen um, on the back end. Mm -hmm. But also like there was something just like that you seem to be lifted by a community and I like that it wasn't a jazz label. Yeah. Um, I went back and listened to some of it, especially the first one. I can't believe how mature and witty and... It's, I mean, you say that you cringe on some, of, but I'm like, damn, this is, I can't believe how young you were making, it sounds great. It's, it's funny looking back, because I felt like compared to the world we're in now, where like people are making their first records a lot younger, because it's, just, it's like kind of easier to in a lot of ways. Yeah. And you kind of just like have to. Yeah. Um, that wasn't nearly like, I don't think that was the case with, with our generation as much. So, I mean, I was in New York, like, I mean, I moved, I started college in 97 and those records were made 10 years later. So, I mean, I'd been like living in Brooklyn for five or six years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, back to like the New Amsterdam thing. Um, I think I was just like wanted to, I was coming from jazz, but wanted to like, I don't know, peek out of, that world oh, interesting. Um, somehow um, I never like felt completely um, you know at home uh, and so I think that would that was a big part of the appeal and uh, that first record actually um, is one of the ones that I'm most proud of some, some there's some like real magic you know just like that that happened and it's insane because we did that record on one, like, one rehearsal. What? I mean, I what? rehearsed with the singers a lot, one-on-one, -on -one, like me just like play, playing piano and like helping them learn the tunes and hearing them sing. Um, but yeah, full band. And then I think Pete Rendy, the amazing pianist, we did some set, we did like a few sessions, just the two of us, because, you know, being like the horn player, I was always like, had a pretty secondary role like in that operation you know I okay. write the stuff obviously right, right. but in terms of like I almost need like an MD to just like all right this is like I'm really gonna know these things and support the singer and give the singer what they need okay um and so yes Pete and I spent some time beforehand as well before that full band rehearsal but yes I just I still have like very clear memories of just like that frenetic whatever six mm. hour day I mean I think I served him lunch in, in between the <laughs> singers were like coming and staggered um, and yeah they're, they're, that really like came together I think actually more than any of the others no um, I mean they're all good. classical music obviously have used poetry in their work for a long time but where did um, you come up with this idea I don't feel like I came up with it. I mean, one thing that I like kind of felt like I was up against a lot um, was that if you said poetry and jazz, everybody thought it was like beatnik spoken word, mm -hmm. um, which is not. There's like a few spoken word things on those 
five albums. Um, but uh, for the most part, I really felt like I was using the poetry as like as the way you know I would like working with lyricists. Yeah, you know, really yeah, like yeah. setting melodies. Um, had you and, worked? With, yeah, you hadn't worked with lyrics be before, right? Not really. Uh, but I was not like there. There's there's a pianist named Frank Carlberg who's really dedicated himself and writes oh, that's right. some amazing things. And um, yeah, there there are definitely some right. others. If Fred Hurst. Um, How did you go about picking the poetry? Um, just obsessively finding um, books yeah. and um, the the internet was starting <laughs> to emerge back then. Yeah. It's okay, a okay. crazy thing to say, but um, yeah, I think just uh, to, there are these various websites with with poetry, and um, but it was really tricky. Because yeah, yeah. There was a lot. There's a lot of like very dense poetry that um, I never wanted to work with. I wanted to find things that sort of like still felt like they, they still had some room. But yeah, that was like really when I started, that was when I started to feel like I had something to say and wanted to make a record. I never felt that kind of like as a just making a saxophone record. Mm. You, just the other day you said you didn't really feel like you were a composer, like a composer, composer, but I mean, come on, you've written all this great music. Uh, what is your process like composing? Um, early on, it was always at the piano. Mm -hmm. And I started to, over the years, realize that that was like a huge limitation because I didn't feel like my writing and my playing were necessarily that connected. Um, and so I started to consciously move away from that. And that's actually why I wrote those um, clarinet etude books. It's like I wanted to write something that was completely like on an instrument. And that was also the period when I was, I was really like starting to take the clarinet a lot more seriously. Um, and um, that was also just a way of developing my clarinet playing as well. Now I would say it's a mix. Um, and I think I've been able to like write a lot more, a lot more easily, you know, in the last, Five or ten years um, than than before. I, was, I think like when I was, I always felt like before I had to start with something that was really like clever and unique and special. And I don't feel now. I'm just like pen to paper. And sometimes it's and I just like I think that some that I let it kind of like to, I think like I'm just like patient and I, like, I will let that like come later. And maybe it doesn't come and the thing, you know, and I don't work with the thing. And that certainly happens. But um, it's, it's, you just need to get something on, on paper. Yes. Polish it. Yeah. And later. so I'll take like, you know, like a, a stylist. I'm like just a lot more comfortable, like opening up stylistic bags that I think I was too self-conscious to open before. And um, yeah, there's just sort of like I've done it enough now to know that like I think uh, I'll emerge, you know, somewhere in the process. I think when I say I'm not a composer is like, I've never written anything extended and I don't really like orchestrate or arrange. I mean, I feel like I basically like kind of write lead sheets with some like other things on them and try to build from there. Oh, come on, don't um, slow yourself short. And um, like those, all the projects are really involved. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. oftentimes, like, I'll write, and, you know, there'll be, like, things in the trouble and the bass staff and, like, some counterpoint in there. But um, beyond that, like, the arrangements and mm -hmm. the contributions really happen, like, in the rehearsal workshop. Yeah, I mean, the clarinet duets that just came out, that's, that was, like, a, that was a big leap for me, actually, like, you know, writing, like, just, like, some pure counterpoint. Definitely, like, I can't play both those things on piano, and I was really reliant on... You know, but playing them on the clarinet and um, the capabilities of working with a notation program where, yeah, yeah. you know, there was a lot of like kind of experiments with like cutting and pasting and moving things around and like kind of minimalist ideas um, that I would never be able to play um, that, you know, are just so easy to like put in there and see yeah, what yeah. they sound like. Yeah. Uh, one thing I've noticed kind of a running theme in a lot of your music is it's accessible to the ear it's tonal oftentimes mm -hmm. but there's like a little rhythmic um 
I don't know, trips in the music that um, un happen unexpectedly that keeps you kind of on your toes as far as your compositional process? Are you, how do you involve rhythm in that way when you're composing? Interesting. I mean, for so, for so long, like when people talked about rhythm, um, I mean, I think rhythmic training was a big hole in my like early training. Um, I don't think it was something that like people really talked, you know, talked to me about and like I ever really thought about. And then I remember, you know, when I got to college, it was funny because it was like Meldau, like starting to like play standards in five and seven. And, and that became like the obsession. I thought that was like rhythm. I thought that was like, you know, working on your rhythm was like meant learning to play in those odd time signatures. Mm. And um, it's funny because like back, you know, like we had our ways of playing those odd time signatures were so codified. I mean, seven was duh, 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 duh. duh. And that was like, that was seven. Um, and um, uh, and then, yeah, I remember like two two things that happened that really like got me thinking. No, it was, it was more than two. Um, I did this thing with Danilo Perez, um, the pianist from Panama and just incredible mountain of energy and music. Um, this um, like Young Musicians Institute in Chicago at the Staines Institute um, that was connected to Ravinia, the Ravinia Festival. Oh, yeah. It was a week with Danilo and some other really, really amazing mentor figures. And um, yeah, he was the first person to just like, let's talk about rhythm and like just spend some time and just like, can you really feel two and three in your body? And I, I couldn't do like the most basic things. I mean, just like, I remember, you know, we'd stand up and just like do two in our feet and, and I had never done that. Yeah, it yeah. It was like, it was totally like, you know, um, an eye-opening thing for me um, that, and it didn't involve playing in five and seven. Um, so there was that, I think there was playing like Colombian music, which, um, has some unbelievable and all the music like in South America, um, the six, eight rhythm, rhythmic stuff is so, so intense and so incredible. And like, you know, you just like the, the having to feel two and three, uh, you know, with and against each other at all times with, um, and like, yeah, playing music where that was in six, eight and I didn't know where one was for years. Um, and I could talk for two hours about that stuff. Um, and um, yeah, there was that. And then, but then I also realized like there was this big gap and just like, I never learned like the, the rhythmic language just in four, four and three, four. And um, I played with Gabriel Cahane for, for a while when mm -hmm. he first got to New York. He's um, a, I don't know how to just class more, I mean, not in the jazz world. He's more like in the classical and folk world, um, but an incredibly rhythmic mind and would write these things in four, four, you know, that were not in odd time signatures, um, but that had such incredible um, rhythm in there and like, you know, I don't, I don't want to call them tricks because they're the tools that like, you know, where you're playing in four and it was so freaking hard. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that's been like, I don't know, the evolution. Yeah. Have you developed ways to get better at the rhythm part? Um, I think they're just like a certain awareness, you know, changed how I listen to music um, and like, you know, really wanting to kind of have a better understanding of of what drummers were doing. Um, I mean, there was like some knowledge because I could play with like, you know, drummers who were playing all over the bar line and I, you know, like mm -hmm. keep, keep know where I was. I mean, I could like, you know, yeah, I just like hadn't really thought about it. And I think um, once I started to think about it, it was just like able to really try to, you know, develop ideas that were more, you know, as an improviser, especially like just that were more based on rhythm. Know, like which is like yeah especially like um playing the colombian music mm. you know like the energy comes from these like rhythmic calls that mm. um you know just like listen to these solos like that the the sort of like um non gringos would play and like the energy level would just like escalate and be so amazing and then we'd play and like it, that energy wouldn't be there anymore and it came you know they sort of like knew these calls and how to build rhythmic energy it's interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, all my sort of like 
jazz education was like lines and language and harmony. Mm -hmm. And um, when, you know, when I go sort of like teach, I don't do this a lot, but when I go do like master classes for, you know, middle school and high school kids, I just like will play over a blues or whatever and like I'll limit them to two notes. Mm -hmm. What can we do with two notes? You know, like can we build some rhythm and like keep it interesting? Um, or like do call and response things. Oh, that's a good idea. I mean, also the rhythm thing. I mean, it's, it's even since we've gotten here, it's just like evolved, right? I feel like it's like the final frontier. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not that's a dark. I yeah. mean, there's a lot other of other frontiers. It's the last one. But um, yeah, I think there was like still and still is just like so much to explore and it's probably like gone to an incredible extreme on the other end yeah. where you know people are like playing rhythmic structures and ideas that I that are way beyond you know my understanding of things but uh, yeah and I also like it uh, to me it came from like branching out from jazz and just really listening to a lot of you know uh, international musics mm. you made an album just playing clarinet it did um some might s see kind of your trajectory and go what's up with that decision <laughs> like wh where did that come from um again it, it kind of just happened kind of organically that more and more people were calling me you know to play clarinet just clarinet or clarinet and saxophone but i felt like i was getting calls because of my clarinet playing mm -hmm. and also you know I played with Darcy James Argue for since he started a band in New York and he once uh, he I you know there's a lot of songs um, in his book that are just where the parts just clarinet actually um, and so that was that was a big part of it and um, I just felt like I was living in the sea of saxophone players and um, and didn't really feel like I had something, you know, to say. Um, and the clarinet just started to feel like my voice. And, um, you know, with even with all its like limitations, um, which are profound, you know, compared to the saxophone, which is just, I don't know, to me, like, uh, what's the analogy? You know, just, I don't know, like to me, like playing the clarinet is like, or playing the saxophone after playing clarinet is like picking up a power tool for the first time. Like, you mean like I don't have to like do this with a hammer and a nail and like unscrew like this? <laughs> I mean, just like um, you can kind of just fly on that instrument. And You're talking like, about the saxophone. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, there's the volume thing and just like so many other things that um, are so incredibly challenging with the clarinet but um I don't know I felt like I had this you know coming to the clarinet having list grown up listening to Sonny Rollins and Joe Henderson and John Coltrane and Stan Getz and like I had something to bring to that instrument that um was unique and just like started to feel more and more like my voice and I felt like just like career-wise there was like a little niche that um, maybe I could find. Mm. Jazz clarinet players, clarinet players in general, who are some of your favorites? There are two living clarinetists who um, are such profound heroes of mine. Um, there's Frank Glover who lives in rural Indiana um, and um, plays just jaw-dropping clarinet. Yeah. I mean, you, you've heard him, I know. and. Um, and it's been we've actually kind of like become friends the past few years i reached out i just um i often do this it's just like when i hear music that really affects me um i if i don't know the person um unless they're like a superstar um but if there's somebody who's kind of like operating on the fringes um i will find a way to write to them and just uh. say, that's thanks for this music and you know not necessarily like an expectation that they're going to respond um and sometimes they do respond in the case of frank he did respond and we kind of like you know have had um a correspondence since um 
So, anyways, but that, sure that's that's yeah. a big part of like what I do, and so much of my like opportunity. You know, you talked about like advice to young musicians, and just like make those connections. Um, that's been such a huge part. I can't tell you like how many yeah. like trajectories my career has gone thanks to those like initial like fan mail yeah, that, yeah. that are essentially that. That's a, that's um, great advice, actually. And uh, so Frank Glover. And then there's an Italian clarinetist, um, Gabrielle Mirabassi, mm. who is just out of this world. I mean, they play things that I'm just like, how did you just do that? Um, have you re and reached out to him? I have. <laughs> Nothing? <laughs> no response. Ah. Um, and um, yeah, and it's insane that, you know, both those guys, like, be, I think Gabrielle, he's, he's, he's fairly known in Europe, but um, nobody knows who he is here. He's prolific output, just uh, really just astonishing. Those are the two giants. And then kind of gone back to the, you know, I didn't grow up like listening to Artie Shaw and um, Benny Goodman and like the, the real giants and Buddy DeFranco is another, you know, huge hero. Um, Tony Scott was somebody I kind of found, um, you know, a lot later. And, um, you know, there's an early period of Tony Scott that's, you know, some of the most incredible clarinet playing ever. It's been a real journey with the clarinet. I mean, I'm coming to an, a very challenging instrument um, without a lot of the kind of like formal training that um, a lot of really um, developed clarinetists had. Um, and a lot of, yeah, without just a lot of that knowledge and also like the really great, I'm just, you see, especially like online, you know, you see like people's, um, the stuff they practice and their routines and you just like see what athletes, these like high level, like classical clarinetists are, Yeah, you know, to play the clarinet and, and it's daunting. And I'm yeah. not that because um, I uh, do all these other things. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a you tough thing. You have to pick your thing. battles. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of gear are you playing? Our listeners, our viewers at home might want to know. <laughs> um, well, thanks to you, <laughs> um, I switched over to playing Selmer clarinets um, during the pandemic. Um, I had actually just like, I grew up, actually, it's funny because my first clarinet was a Selmer that I got from Vince Trombetta. It was like this weird model, the Selmer Omega, oh. I think. It was like short lived. And it had this weird, like, double octave. This is such clarinet dark, but um, like a double octave key for the B flat. They tried to like really clean up the throat B flat and make it sing. So there was like this double octave key mechanism Here. that I didn't know enough about the time. It must have been problematic because it never caught on. Um, and even Selmer like never continued to to do it. But um, I do remember that about. It. But then you know everybody buffet R thirteen buffet R thirteen, and that that's what I kind of ended up playing for. 20 years probably and um yeah i think was just like sort of curious to try and um you had this set of summer recitals um that you had sort of yeah. like <laughs> thanks to pascal Arquette. yes um and um though i'm just like in love with those clarinets and it's kind of like um, oh, great kind of opened up so much and yeah i mean i think it's the clarinet equivalent of like going from like a selmer to a con in a lot of ways, you know, yeah. like it's it, yeah. it's it's kind of a big instrument. Um, it's a lot thicker, you know. The the keys are a little bit further apart, and um, most clarinetists kind of pick it up and just noop. And uh, you know, I kind of like have committed myself to it. And to me, there's just like there's a sound there, and I feel like I don't hit a wall with it, um, you know, sound wise um, that I did with my the phase what mouthpiece read situation um there's a mouthpiece refacer um in sheep's head bay brooklyn um eddie novikov who's um you know like my father's generation russian uh, which both my parents are you know russians um who is just a wizard um clarinet refacer so i have two phobes europa mouthpieces I got turned on to these Europa mouthpieces for like, Vasco Dukovsky. I took a lesson with him, incredible mm. Macedonian clarinetist who's just like such a hero on the instrument. 
Um, and then um, I took these phobes and a bunch of other my other mouthpieces to Eddie. And Eddie is actually really magical because um, he will only work on a mouthpiece if you're there um, playing, playing it for him and really kind of like listens to you, watches you, um, and um, takes your mouthpiece and does some sort of Rasputin wizardry yeah. and it comes back. And, um, yeah, he's not somebody like who is so you know much about the numbers of so much or like has like well, this is the facing that i really like who has like a thing that he does he's really like he's a real artist um yeah and yeah i have these two um b flat clarinet mouthpieces that he's made okay um and then uh i almost always end up coming back to van Dorn. It's, um <laughs> you know i kind of like um, change the, the different blue box uh typically not um, I was on the V12 thing, and then I just like found a bunch of old boxes of um, uh, the Rue Le Pique 65 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And those seem to have, those seem to be working. Okay. Um, so maybe like three and a half, four, so. three, uh, like three point seven five, but I kind of like work them down a little bit. I don't play okay. like a very resistant mouthpiece. Yeah. And you know, and I think this. I think to be an improviser on the clarinet, um, I mean, overall, I mean, I kind of grew up playing really resistant setups. I was a biter, you know, really severe biter. I mean, oh. like, I would, like, have to change my mouthpiece patch every week, okay. you know, because I'd bite through it. And, um, and uh, you know, and that's something that I have, like, worked to fix over the years. Um and um and i've just like moved to softer and softer and softer setups and oh, 3.75 you know, isn't <laughs> so no but i work those down and um and it's not a very resistant mouthpiece oh, okay um and um so yeah and i just like you can't imp it's very hard to improvise on the clarinet with like a very resistant setup mm -hmm. and it's very hard for me to just like get the sounds I mean, I think, you know, classical musicians can, can use that kind of setup because, um, you know, like in an orchestra, you're not playing all the time. You know, the, amount, the actual, like, amount of time you're playing is often, uh, you know, you, there's huge gaps. Um, they do that athletic training that I don't do. But also, you know what you're going to play, you know. And so yeah, you, you can, can be you can kind of, like build that intent and put that in there and you have to be flexible as an improviser that's true I yeah i feel like it's you know just like trying to if you're playing a super hard setup it's trying to like dance like wearing like a suit of armor on uh, you know it's just like you can't you can't be you can't have that that fight and you have to just like really be be nimble um but also but yeah unfortunately like if you're playing a softer setup then volume becomes a more challenging thing and um, that's still just something that I'm constantly negotiating and mm. figuring out. And, you know, I'm, I got myself like a really nice um, microphone, you know, four or five years ago. And I'm trying to at places where I know there's going to be sound. I try to bring that because mm. I know like I'll just like, you know, the instrument will get picked up really well. And um, that's been that's been a huge help. But there's a lot of situations where you don't want to amplify yourself you know like intimate situations yeah. and, and those are tricky and yeah playing with drummers are tricky i mean that's like my solomon diary stuff is just with accordion and we're just like as we play more and more we play softer and softer and softer and um, and i love it yeah like, i love that, it too that's my happy place can we maybe play a little would you yeah would you too. play some of the couple of these duets uh, yeah <laughs> Thank you. 
tell us more about these beautiful creations that you've made. Uh, thanks. Yeah, the duet books um, were something that I actually had on my mind for like many, many years and remember taking a stab at, um, I don't know, probably 10 years ago and, um, you know, not feeling ready. Um, and then um, this world, of, you know, we we'll talk about sort of, we talked earlier about, um, you know, not having like a real like planned trajectory or whatever. And, um, you know, this kind of like I was invited to start playing with the Philip Glass Ensemble um, in 2020. Um, and I've since, you know, become like a full time member of it. And, um, you know, that wasn't I had knowledge of that music, but um, it wasn't music that I knew deeply. And it really like profoundly affected, you know, the way I think. And, um, and, you know, a lot of these, these clarinet duets, um, not all of them, but a lot of them came from sort of like, um, the, this world of minimalism and me wanting to kind of like see if I could, um, incorporate some of those techniques and ideas. And, um, yeah, I went just, I'd spent probably like a year, just every time I had like a little opening idea for something, recording it into my phone. And then at some point I had probably like 30 or 40 of these things that I like sat down and transcribed um, and then just like had these papers and kind of started from there. And then they sort of like perpetuated itself. And um, I had a slow summer last summer and um, really just like started writing really intensely, just like huh. one or two a day. Um, and, um, it was really, really fun, especially like I was talking about earlier, like with the notation program, just being able to hear it back right away and also mess with, you know, moving things around and, and see what happens. And, you know, like the, this one migrations that, that we just played, that's like an example of me, like, you know, starts off with like, so shamelessly, like a Philip Glass kind of like pattern that you've also like heard in like, you know, 700 movies and, and, you know, just like starting that off with like a certain faith that like, as, as I get into this, like there's going to be something there that's, you know, not just that, that emerges. And, um, and there's these slippery little harmonic things that happen. That, yeah, that and it, really is something I discovered, you know, in his music too, where it's just like he slips, like the, you know, somebody changes the progression before somebody else, and uh, and it just somehow works. Or just like there's it took me a long time, like I, I was really like tidy in my writing for a long time in terms of like, you know, the notes and the chords really lining up. Um, and I feel like I'm just starting to like get past that a little mm. bit and sometimes like embrace like that works. I don't know why, but yeah, that, that, that works. And, um, yeah, and there's a couple moments in the, this past one where, um, there's this, this rub and it's just so, it feels so nice to hear it wrong, you know? Uh -huh. Like, a, yeah, this little moment right there. Yeah, I mean, we want to fill up like most legendary pieces i mean they're most like listened to pieces is this piece called facades from glassworks and it's a oh. soprano it features two soprano saxophone players i mean the one features one much more prominently and andrew sturman plays that part um incredibly um and you know the pianists are playing like c minor arpeggios i think and um he holds an e you know and it's a long e over that and like my friend the other Concert. day told me, yeah, my friend told me like he put his kid to bed listening to this song, you know, this song the other night. And it just like somehow completely works. I mean, you you only realize it when you're playing. Yeah. And it's just like, wow, you sort of have to find that note's place. Yeah. But um, I didn't have actually even realize it like the first handful of times we played it. That's interesting. Briefly talked about Solomon Diaries. Do you want to talk about the impetus of that or? or um... I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell um, us what that is. And... Yeah, the Solomon Diaries is kind of this Jewish-inspired music. I don't know what to call it. I'm still working on that. Jewish adjacent. Um, it's you know clarinet and accordion duo. My friend um, collaborator is a guy named Nathan Kosi, who's just like a one-of-a-kind musician. 
an accordionist. Um, and yeah, I kind of just got, got deeper into those styles. I mean, I could always sort of like imitate the klezmer style. I grew up hearing it. My father was a klezmer clarinetist and accordionist, and, you know, just like every like family party became like musical in the backgrounds of, you know, my parents and their friends playing. And I just like heard that, I heard that sound and I could always like mimic that style. Um, but never really wanted to completely like dive in and learn the repertoire, um, the way that, you know, some of my peers have. D did your father play in that style too? Did he play that music? Yes. He um, did. Yeah. Oh yeah. My okay. father was like an encyclopedia of, um, songs that like nobody else knew. I mean, my father really grew up like in the shtetl yeah. and, um, played clarinet and accordion largely because like the weddings would go on for days and the musicians would have to take breaks. So it was like, here, hold my clarinet, you know, and they're like, you play accordion now, you know, and so that they, they would take breaks. But, um, you know, just also like having an unbelievable repertoire of songs and also like being able to like play medleys of them. It wasn't like, and now for this, you know, tune, we're going to play this. It was like, you know, you just played straight. Music didn't stop. Um, so, uh, Anyways, yeah, so stylistically, and it was something I've played in, I've also like played in synagogues and with cantors the last 10 years. And then I did this Broadway show called The Band's Visit, which was another example of just like me getting a call out of nowhere and, you know, like completely just saying yes to something that I had no idea where it was going. And it really upended my life because it was a Broadway show where the musicians were actually on stage. So we had to do weeks and weeks and weeks of the actual like, grueling cast rehearsal schedule and um you know my son um who's my second kid was very very young at the time and it was just like crazy time and like i sort of can't believe i just like you know called my wife and i said like i think i i think i should do this what do you think and she said yeah i think you should do it too and um you know we made it work um i don't quite know how but um and i'm really did ended up going to Broadway and winning 10 Tonys and being like, yeah. um, you know, just like a really amazing, like career altering experience, you know, it was like a very unique Broadway show in which um, musicians were on stage, um, quasi acting, but also like really featured and improvising. And um, we're playing a lot of these like Jewish inspired and also very Arabic inspired um pieces and i learned so much you know like playing with the musicians like you know who had a lot more experience especially with the arabic stuff um and just kind of like imitating them you know hearing um like the oud player and the violinist solo and just trying to to, um, to copy them um so anyways um that show was coming to a close it was kind of like a almost three-year run like you know and it was a, those shows are are a grind um, and I, ha I wasn't really doing anything like creatively during that time. And um, so, yeah, as that show was kind of winding down, um, I decided like, and you know, my tastes and I'd been moving like in this more like folky, simp trying to write like simpler music. Um, and I decided to just start writing um, pen to paper and, uh, and started writing these things and had like a huge body of work, like within a year. Um, you know, 35 or 40 songs. Did, and, did you say that, did you talk about the Borscht Belt? Did, no, I didn't. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then as, as I was writing, um, I also like um, stumbled upon this book um, of photographs by Marissa Scheinfeld, um, an amazing photographer called The Borscht Belt. That's like the modern day remnants of um, the Borscht Belt, which is this region in upstate New York that was this real like vibrant cultural center um, for Jews um you know for you know about a i don't know almost a hundred years probably but ended up having like a very profound impact upon um american cultural life um and uh it was just totally fascinating and i or these photographs are fairly like they're of the modern kind of like ruins of these places because the, the the region like fell um very very fast in the 60s and 70s and um you know these once like grand grand resorts were just sort of like abandoned and left to ruin and she kind of went in you know 30 years later and like these places just like nature had sort of like reemerged in these places and it was just like it's fascinating look at what happened you know what happens yeah when places are kind of left and abandoned 
Um, and yeah, I started writing these pieces that were fairly like kind of like desolate and airy and very, very open, which was kind of new for me. But then I started learning more and more about the region itself and just like developed this really weird fascination um, with you know, the rise and fall of it and the history and like really connecting to it somehow, even though I grew up on the West Coast and was never, I never went to any of those places. But to me, it was like a story of like, you know, people who are refugees um, coming to a new country and, um, you know, hanging on to certain things from the old country, but building things anew and finding their place. And also, you know, building this thing because they were basically, I mean, Jews built this place because they were excluded Mm -hmm. from mainstream non-Jewish places. They, yeah. Those places were very explicitly no Jews allowed. And so their response was, you know, we're going to build our own. And they built this, just what they built was so incredible. Um, and then that it sort of fell so fast is also, you know, such a fascinating story. So, um, but yeah, and so I was starting to sort of, it started off as like a quartet with accordion and percussion and acoustic guitar and we did some gigs and that's kind of like how I saw it going and then um right before the pandemic um I don't know not right before like November 2019 um the percussionist and the guitarist couldn't make something like a performance at a museum that I booked and Nathan and I did it by ourselves um Nathan's the accordionist and um there was something really really special in in the duo um and then we didn't play and the pandemic happened and um once i didn't play for a long time for like four months i didn't even like pick up an instrument the first four months of the pandemic um and uh once i started playing again i just like went back to all this material and um found ways that nathan and i could you know safely rehearse within like the restrictions of that time and we found a way to record and um it was like so i think you know like that for, we talked about that first words project record i think like you know i didn't have much going on when i recorded that i think that's one of the reasons that it still like has um is really special to me i really feel like i like dove in so fully with that and committed myself and worked and reworked those those songs so much that I didn't do with later records you know I think just like I couldn't do with later records I had a family and you know started to have more of a playing career um and so yeah and I feel like I was really able to do that thanks to this like awful pandemic um you know, just, I basically completely focused on that material. And I also, Nathan was kind of like really able to devote himself in like an incredibly deep way. And we, um, you know, I like very, um, I don't always love to rehearse, you know, I, I kind of, there's a lot of material that I prefer not to rehearse, but that stuff, um, we did really rehearse and workshop and kind of like orchestrate and arrange and build the songs and experiment and um, having just like that expanse of time to do that um, was incredible. And then, you know, we recorded three albums, we recorded 28 of the songs <laughs> and it really like just got me through it was like i don't know i just call it like my pandemic lemonade mm. you know is are there going to be more you think uh i hope so yeah yeah i mean we've talked a little bit about philip glass i don't know if you want to talk further about it um, yeah well the this first the invitation to start playing with the group um you know uh john gibson one of the original members um, his health was really starting to decline, and sadly, he passed away, I think, in 2020 or 2021. Um, but it was becoming harder and harder for him to make some of the tours, and so they were starting to think about um, bringing somebody new on. And, yeah, I just had a history with both Andrew Sturman and Peter Hess. There's three wind players in there, and, um, you know, they had... Uh, they asked me to do kind of this initial like round of gigs that were sort of like my audition. 
And, um, you know, she liked my, my mantra, say yes. And this was like so <laughs> incredible. And that they, you know, that was like, that was such a no brainer. I mean, to like step inside yeah. the, that legacy and um, that incredible, incredible body of work that's just like such and had such an impact on music you know some you know the people have very strong opinions on his his music but you know something that like you can't deny is like all oh, this music that came later that would not exist if not for um philip's music and like you just can't watch any films without like you know people you know copying his his stuff it's just so powerful yeah um so yeah, but it's, I mean, I remember Andrew Sturman, who's just like, I could talk about him so much. He's been like such an incredible mentor for me. And and it came, that came from like me reach, I mean, reaching out to him for a lesson, which is another way that like I've made some of like the real key relationships in my life and career mm. came from that. Not that I was like looking like I'm going to take a lesson with this guy because he's going to help me or like a lot of people, like especially Broadway, like will take lessons with the guys and then maybe they'll they'll use you and that was not i just like you told me that was you told me that he was like this guru yeah we're thinking and i'd never yeah. heard of him and looked at his website and just like was so blown away by the things that he wrote on there and i'm just like i'm gonna go take a lesson myself and so it, it struck up you know now like i don't know probably almost 14 year relationship or something 13 year relationship yeah but i remember andrew andrew asked me if I wanted to do these groups and to, to do these gigs and my initial thing was like, I don't circular breathe. And cause I thought that was like the thing mm -hmm. that you did to play this music that was continuous. There's no rest. Yeah. Um, and, um, and he said, no, that's not, that's not, that's not what we do. And so, I mean, the, the group is three wind players. Um, Andrew plays quite a bit of flute and I play soprano saxophone and flute. And then Peter plays mostly, you know, alto tenor soprano. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, and it's with, then there's three keyboards as well. And one of the keyboards is, is a vocalist as well. Um, and so most of the stuff in the wind parts is actually in the keyboard parts. And the, the wind parts are sort of this like cream on top that's kind of like this, the human element. And so we're meant, the keyboards are pretty like, uh, stable n texture that that doesn't change that often, but you know because the three wind players we also we all need to take rests and breathe. Um, the texture of our section is actually kind of almost always changing, and that's actually like really the intent mm. there. Um, that's awesome. But that said, there's like this really you know the three of us really try to be aware of you know when the others are kind of breathing or taking like you know sometimes you're playing like pieces that are you know 30 minutes and like you do more than just breathe you, like take a sip of water you know you take a sip of water really like you need to give yourself um some real time so there's there's like this incredible um connection and teamwork that happens in that way where you know it's like we, we try not to have two people dropping you know dropping out um but yeah and i feel like that music also has such a deep deep rhythmic component that really like draws it's definitely not jazz um but it draws so much on like that we were talking about rhythm earlier and like the rhythmic you know training i've done and the thinking i've done and, you know and like the two against three and really like really being able to feel that like deeply in your body um i imagine there's like some weird sort of concentration that you have to have to just keep focused it's um it's a concentration that you that i'm still learning and getting better at and some nights are better than others and it's also you know knowing like learning the pieces well enough that you can get back on if you get back off like that's you know i like peter and i often talk about how we'll practice in a way um like almost like drop the needle and like kind of find your place um, which is really challenging, but that that's the skill that you kind of have to have. Or oftentimes, like, you know, there are these cells that repeat. So if I'm practicing with the record, you know, when we perform, we're cued out of each cell by Michael Reisman. Um, but when you're practicing with the recording, you don't, there's no visual cues. 
So it's actually really good training because you're getting lost constantly because they go on to the next thing and it, you know, they might sound like very, very so similar that you don't hear that change right away, but you realize eventually you're off and you've got to get back on. Um, so that's definitely, but yeah, no, it's like really, we travel and... Um, yeah, where are you headed? Uh, we were just in Montreal um, last week and then in the fall we'll kind of like be all over Europe and um, playing in Abu Dhabi. And uh, yeah, that's going to be a really fun, what a longer tour than I've done in a long time. Yeah. So um, exciting. Yeah, but it's like, you know, like we talked, you almost like, those are concerts, but yeah, for us, they're kind of like athletic events. And there's a really like a self-care thing that, you know, is always part of touring and also being a musician and like you know i just always remember like you know playing shows or whatever like, mm -hmm. i knew that like i have this thing at the end of my that's kind of at the end of my day and i gotta like make sure that there's like something left and not like run myself ragged but oftentimes i would run myself ragged but you know sometimes like if you don't know the show that well like you just you know that like there's this thing um and uh yeah, there's like a real self-care that um, that I try to do. Sometimes, what does that like, involve? Sometimes I'm just like in a really beautiful, amazing city and I like kind of just chill in the hotel room because I just know I have this thing. And not only do we have the gig, but um, that group doesn't rehearse. I mean, we rehearse like and we, we rehearse and sound check and like solve problems there. But the sound check is also very, very long because it's not an acoustic band. It's... It's a mm. big, big, powerful sound, and there's a lot of very, very specific sound things right. that um, we sort out in every every venue. So different sound wise, and um, so we do the, the sound checks are often, you know, Six two to three hours. Oh, you know, and then um, and then you have like hour or two break, and then you know, three hour, sometimes a two three hour concert, or sometimes like a much longer concert, you know, like. I was actually really thrown in the deep end with that group because um, the first piece I performed with them was, was music in 12 parts, which um, that performance goes on for five hours, which um, there's some breaks um, that happen, um, but it's a solid like four hours of, of playing. Um, how, how do you find success for yourself? Um, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's just like chasing a carrot to me and like just accepting that you're always going to be chasing the carrot, you know, like, you know, that cartoon image, oh, yeah, like yeah. the carrot on a string and, uh, it's always in front of you. And, uh, I don't know if that's some sort of like sickness for me and maybe something that I'm going to like really have to reckon with at some point. I'm actually, it's feeling I, I am reckoning with it um, a little bit. Um, but I, yeah, I never, t I don't know. There's like, I'm still like want, you know, when you're part of something that is meaningful um, and, um, you know, get to like have that connection with people. Um, it's, it's really magical. You know, it's not something that like, you know, just limited to like the music world to me, like to me, like that happens in theater and like being, getting to be part of like really cool theater is something that I really love. And I'm trying to write a musical. That's been one of my other like pandemic, you know, things that, you know, came that like, I don't think I would have ever taken on um, otherwise. And, um, but uh yeah, I, I don't think in terms of like success will be this and I'll feel a certain way. It's just like I want to get better and just like have more and more of um, those really like special opportunities. I mean, so yeah, I just wanted to write things that were easier than my etudes um, that I wanted like advanced musicians but even like advancing musicians and students to have things to play that had like modern musical concepts in them but weren't like intensely 20th and 21st century you know which most of those things like they require a lot of study um before you can like really really play them you can't like yeah. play them casually 
Sure. And I just like could never find things that were written for the clarinet that um I think two players, like advanced players, could just like get together and read through and you know, by the hopefully second or third read through, or some of them are actually you know, hopefully by the first read through, like be making some music. You wanna play one more? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again. I hope you enjoy this. Until next time, be well.